this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work again. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. This episode of Built to Sell Radio is brought to you by Prescore. What on earth is a Prescore? Pre stands for personal readiness to exit your company. And here we're looking to evaluate how personally ready you are to leave your company. You know, when you go to sell a business to have a successful exit and look back on it without regret, you need two things. Number one, a company that is attractive to an acquirer, to a company that's built to sell. And number two, you personally need to be ready to exit that business. We found that there are four drivers of a happy and lucrative exit, four ways you can personally ready yourself to exit your business. And by completing your pre-score, you are going to see how you're performing against those four major drivers of a happy and lucrative exit. Just go to prescore.com. When I say scrap metal dealer, what comes to mind? If you're anything like me, it's some guy with a pickup truck that sort of tilted to one side, stacked up with old laundry machines and lawnmowers and driving around town looking for a few pieces of metal to buy and sell for a few extra bucks. I mean, it's not a pretty sight. My next guest, Jean-Eric Plamondon, looked to reinvent the business of scrap metal, but he did it in a unique way. He found that farmers were keen to clean up their farms. And instead of offering to buy by the ton, he decided to offer a farm cleanup service, repositioning himself against all of the other shady competitors in the marketplace. He got to the point where he was so good, he was buying metal for as little as $3 a ton and turning around and selling it for more than $100 a ton to a local smelter. It was an incredible business while it lasted. And in this episode, you're going to hear Jean Arc talk about the secrets of building this business. He'll really kind of delve into how he marketed the company and really positioned it to differentiate himself from the typical scrap metal dealer. He'll talk about in any negotiation why possession is nine tenths of the law. We'll talk about the justice system and how that's different than the legal system and the implications of that for any sort of partnership agreements you may strike. jean Eric describes the systems that he put in place that enabled the business to run largely without him and what a vendor take back is and the implications that has on a potential sale of your company. Here to tell you the whole story is jean Eric Plamondon. jean Eric, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. John, glad to be here. You were in the scrap metal business. Like when we first got on video link, I'm expecting this guy with like chopping on the, like a, like an unlit cigar, maybe a fedora, <laughs> a roll of hundreds in his hand. What do you want for it? <laughs> How did you get into the scrap metal business? Well, I think, you know, the beer is the only thing that stuck. I actually grew the beer just for that, that look per se. Um, but I, I guess I identify myself more as a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've had over 10 companies now and what led me to the scrap business was, uh, I had a, a few coin comp or a few, a few online e-commerce companies I was running at a time at one point. And one of them was a coin company. So we were manufacturing these products, uh, overseas and warehousing them and retailing, wholesaling around, around the world. Um, and our hottest seller at the time. So these products, just to give you a background, they were fractional coins. Bullion is the technical term. So bars and coins that were minted and it was essentially just trinkets for collectibles. But there was also a huge segment around the world that I discovered after the fact of people who believed that the currency was going to collapse one day. So they call themselves survivalists. Hmm. This market exploded. We created a whole category on eBay and our biggest selling item was copper items. So I was trying to figure out a way and copper was actually very expensive in China. So from what I understand, I think they were just going through a middle class boom. They were bringing piping and, and running water in and all this stuff. So copper was actually quite expensive to manufacture in China, although the labor and process was cheap. The input cost was quite expensive. 
So I started, and I think I attended a seminar, I read a book about vertical integration. I think it was about the Rockefellers. We all know the story of how they got into the oil and then they bought the trains to transport their oil. Sure, and then they, got, yeah. then they got into steel to make the rails for their own trains, et cetera, et cetera. So they essentially started to own their own supply chain. I thought, well, where's the cheapest place to buy scrap, uh, you know, copper? And I got led down the path of scrap metal. And so, okay, well, who buys scrap metal? And then we went the rabbit hole for a, uh, yeah, a scrap yard. And so when I think of scrap metal, I think of those guys kind of rummaging through backyards and, you know, side lots of, of buildings uh, with a pickup truck and they stock like old dishwashers on top. Like, is, was that the way you were going about it or how did you? Approach no, it? not at all. I mean, I, I say tongue in cheek, those guys were somewhat of my competitors um, but not at all. So a lot of times when people drive by a scrap, scrap yard, the average person, the average, uh, like the public members, they think that's just a garbage uh, fill landfill, but there's a, there's a ton of value in a scrap yard, a ton of, uh, also money to be made in it. So I started approaching scrap yard business owners that didn't have a really good exit plan or good exit strategy. Generally, they've made a lot of money in their lifetime, but their kids went on to professional services and didn't want to get their hands dirty, literally like mom and dad. So I, I approached a few companies that had no succession plan. They were in their 60s, 70s, and started to negotiate some pretty favorable vendor take back terms to, what, to so explain a vendor take back people for people who don't know what that term is. Um, so I didn't even know what the term was either because I'm, you know. Uh, but I later learned that was the term. So I started negotiating with the business owner to say, well, look, you don't have a sellable enterprise here. Um, so why, like, what is it worth to you? And generally speaking, it was fairly rudimentary. Just here's our assets and here's how much money we make. So let's multiply that a little bit. And in my case, you know, we, it was basically the value of the assets and they were going to finance it for me at a favorable interest rate. So in this case, it was like 8% annual. But the business made enough money to pay for all of that and myself and some. So it was a no brainer for me, especially being young. And the terms were that they would stay on with six to 12 months to make sure I was trained and, you know, running this thing properly. Great. And so for our listeners, vendor take back is when you as the seller choose to carry a note. In essence, you basically agree to finance part of the part or all of the other, you know, the buyer's, uh, if, uh, expense in, in buying your company, you usually charge an interest rate. In this case, it sounded like you got 8% or you paid 8%, excuse me. Uh, but the deal is in the take back component is that if you renege on paying your, you know, the interest and, and payments, then the old owner, the legacy owner gets his or her business back. So that was the basic deal that you were proposing, right? That they would carry. That's the right. Money. You know, and as the buyer, you know, being young, didn't have a lot of money to to, to throw in. Um, I was also giving myself some time to do the due diligence in the company. So let's say things were really off from what they promised. It was, it was a way to introduce due diligence in the process. Got it. And so how did this transform into work on farms? Because ultimately you rebranded Prairie Metal Recycling and started to kind of focus on a certain segment of the market. Tell me about that journey. So that was an offshoot uh, that actually wasn't the company that I was trying to acquire. So in the process of, we, we had a paper deal, we signed on it, but their deal was they wanted me to actually work it for six months to show that I was serious. And so for where I'm from, I'm, I'm in the Canadian prairies, central Canada, Winnipeg, Manitoba. I grew up in the city though. So I do, I know nothing about big equipment and all that stuff. So I had to go get my class one driver's license, which I think is a, uh, I think what they call it in the, in the States, but it's a, um, like my heavy truck, 18 wheeler license. And I went out and started working it for, you know, six, the six month trial period. In that process, I, I stumbled into uh, some personal divorce challenges where my marriage was not going right. So the owners allowed me to put things on hold, come back to Winnipeg and sort some stuff out with, uh, with uh, my marriage. In that process, things didn't work out with the marriage and the business actually moved on. They ended up finding another person to buy. And uh, so I started another company where I was manufacturing other things in China and I needed a huge cash influx. I had uh, our national BDC bank, Business Development Canada, approach me, say they were going to back it. 
the numbers were good, but last minute didn't. In that process, because I learned a lot about the scrap metal business out in uh, Saskatchewan, and while I was there doing my six month working period to, you know, due diligence slash prove myself, I saw there was a lot of farmers that were begging for us to take their farm scrap. And at the time, no one was really accepting farm scrap. Uh, at least none of the smelters, like the end buyers of this steel, were really buying the steel uh, in that raw form. Um, in the industry, they called it popcorn scrap, which is a little technical for just saying it wasn't dense enough for the smelters to make it m worthwhile. And that's when uh, a partner and I decided to look into, well, how can we apply um, a profitable model to cleaning up farms all across the Canadian prairies? Interesting. So let me get the, the arc of the story here. So you're kind of intrigued by scrap metal through the vertical integration. You, you go off, you have some personal issues on the divorce front. And so you kind of walk away from the, the deal, but you've got that knowledge and learning of the scrap metal and you've kind of, you've been bitten by the bug, so to speak. And so you come back to Winnipeg and, 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 and decide to focus in on farms. What was the next step in this journey? Well, the big things, number one, there are some, um, le how would I say this, regulations around recycling scrap metal with environmental concerns. So I, I didn't want to have to buy and start a new scrap yard. A lot of the scrap yards, especially in Canada, are generally grandfathered in because the stuff they did on, those, on the land a long time ago, you wouldn't be able to do today, but they're now kind of sanctioned a scrap yard. So it gets tougher and tougher to buy a designated yard. So I, I thought to myself, well, how do I build a scrap yard without the scrap yard component? And uh, first thing we did is we approached uh, one of the smelters in the prairies who historically has never bought, no one would buy farm scrap. And uh, after a little convincing and quite a few trips down, I ended up speaking with the VP of this uh, large uh, steel um, smelting company. And they said to be fine, because like, I just wouldn't leave them alone. They just said, look, if you can get us 2,000 tons, or sorry, 1,000 tons in the first 30 days, which is a huge number, uh, we'll consider doing a deal with you. And so off we went. So we, we took a lot of the technology that we would see in a big scrap yard and found smaller components and created some interesting ways of getting on the farm sites with you know, road restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. And we ended up hitting that target and so. So we hit 2,000 tons in the first 30 days. So and that's so, what triggered. And so this allowed you to get a contract with the smelter who would basically take the scrap metal that you were dropping off and, and, and basically turn it into recycled metal. Is that, is that basically Exactly. It? Exactly. So what was the business model, Jean, Eric? Like in terms of like, how did you make money in this process? So the business is actually quite, it's flipped. You know, our customers, the way we would view customers were actually people we were buying scrap off of. And whereas as, you know, traditional business, your customers are the people you're selling to. So mm -hmm. uh, our biggest challenge, well, after we got someone that would buy our scrap metal, you know, and to fast forward that, they eventually opened up a whole section in their yard. They ended up hiring eight employees just to handle our uh, the amount of scrap we were bringing in because they had to do some processing, but because we brought enough volume, it made sense for them. So once we had that figured out, and we also negotiated some really good payment terms, which we can touch on later, which helped with cash flow and growth and growing. Uh, we had to really focus on, okay, how do we get this scrap now? And um, so our buyers or our customers, which we were buying off of, we had to really look at how are we positioning ourselves? So the people that you referred to at the beginning of the call, you mentioned, you know, the guys at the pickup trucks and, you know, rickety, it's just overall shady individuals. Yeah. That, those were our competitors. So there were people that would go out to farms and they'd show up with a big torch or they'd show up with a crusher. And, you know, sometimes they were paying fairly good price for this stuff. Um, you know, the widget in, in scrap is, you know, the, the unit of measure is tons. So people were paying between 80 and $120 a ton in the middle of nowhere of Canada to buy it off the farmers. So when we approached farmers, first question invariably was, how much are you paying a ton? And so our biggest difference is that we really started to 
focus on how do we position ourselves differently than a, than a uh, scrap metal company. And that's when we started to look, look at ourselves as a cleanup company. So we were a farm cleanup company. We didn't even talk about dollars per ton. And we started to talk about what were the pain points of our customer. And so the pain points of our customer were pretty obvious after meeting with a few of them. But we can get into that uh, if you want. Yeah, I'd love to know what they were. So, because in the <laughs> end, I mean, it's just, it's just the crap on my farm. It's a commodity. Like I, you know, I think if I owned a farm, I'd be in the same boat. I'd be like, what, what's your price? <laughs> like 80 bucks or a hundred bucks a ton. Like I would feel it's a commodity. So how did you change that in the mind of the farmer into, I want to buy farm cleanup services? Uh, well, so to our generations, yeah, absolutely. We want that stuff out of here. But to the older generations, it, there was a, a bit of a cultural thing. Uh, a lot of the farmers that were on these farms were the same farms that it's their great grandfathers that started. And these are the people that went through uh, the depression. They went through, you know, a lot of um, people that came over to Canada in, in immigration in the times where their home country was going through a lot of depression and poverty. So there's this culture of save everything, throw nothing out. So that was one of the objections that we had to kind of work through. They always thought this was some good iron and one day we can maybe use it again. So that was one objection we had to work through because that rusting heap of metal was not usable. But, so how do you say that in a non-offensive way? And the second aspect is these people were, um, they were skeptical that we could get it done in uh, a way that was uh, respectful to their environment, like to their, their yard, and actually get the job done. So a lot of people would overpromise and underdeliver. And so we would call that like the cherry picking factor. So we would have the, those guys in the pickup trucks show up, uh, start using torches, which is a big no, no, because a torch is fire and that can light their millions of dollars of crops on fire, which is not covered by their insurance industry, uh, insurance companies. So little fun fact, when we learned that it was like, okay, great. No torches for sure. And these guys would come in and take the valuable parts of the, off the farm equipment. So they'd take the big copper radiators off the front of the tractors or take the engine or take the catalytic converters, which has platinum in it, and then just kind of leave the stripped vehicle there, just the shell. So you got tires on your, you still got all the crap, <laughs> none of the metal. Interesting. Exactly. So now you have an, an even bigger mess. And, you know, farmers couldn't approach it with their farm equipment because it would blow their tires. And so it was, it was really a nightmare for them. So that was where we started to say, okay, well, we brought in some expensive custom equipment from Italy, like these huge 52-inch magnet discs that could pick up like six Tesla of, of metal, which is like thousands of pounds at a time. You know, farmers loved hearing about that. And so we started to show, like, we are going to promise you a 95% cleanup. 95 because let's be real 100 percent we can't clean up all those cans that your grandpa threw behind the shed for the last 50 years so you know we would do the 95 and we would explain what that looks like and what that means um and the last thing of course is we are so uh c confident that we're going to get this done we will pay you today and so wow so you're putting money <clears throat> in their hands the day you sort of do the contract that's right how did you figure it out? How did you figure out what you were willing to pay for all this metal? So when I came in the industry, um, and I've done a lot of sales in my previous companies. So I've learned how to have a little bit of like the, the script, the story, overcome some objections. So when I came in and I saw people were paying between 80 and 120, uh, in that six months, I was, I was buying some scrap in that, uh, 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 due diligence pays that one scrap yard. And I was able to start getting it down to about $60 a ton. And that was like revolutionary. Like, how are you doing this? And I think that was just basic framing and, and sales script and negotiating. By the end of it, we were uh, buying it between three and $5 a ton. Wow. So, <laughs> so how did we get there? It was a bit of a process. And so that process was, uh, well, first of all, we never talked about dollars per ton ever. Um, and number two, uh, we started to, uh, we, we had some positioning. So like in our scripting for our salespeople, we would talk about, you know, what are the factors that are going to drive your price? And so we do say, say things like, well, it depends on how much you have for scrap. 
uh, how spread out is this scrap metal and how hard is it to get to? You know, and, and especially in Saskatchewan, they have these like alkali soil patches where if you have anything that goes in there, you may risk completely losing your piece of equipment. Like it's just like Canadians, a Canada's equivalent of quicksand, which I've never even heard of until this business. But so, you know, we, we had to start working with the farmer. So it incentivized the farmer to give us more because they were always undecided about that old steam tractor that had three trees growing through the engine because, you know, maybe we'll restore it one day. Right. But, you know, so we incentivize them. Like, if you give us more, we'll give you more money. And if you can help us by dragging some of your cars out and bring it in piles, again, we'll give you more money. So we worked with them on that component. Um, and I think one of my secret weapons as well is we, uh, we started bringing, when I brought a sales team in, um, I hired girls that grew up on farms. So they knew how to like interact with farmers because they were either from a family of farmers and they understood what farm equipment was. Um, and we would do the training with those girls to, you know, I would create um, a, a very simplified system of farm equipment categorized by colors because salespeople love colors. <laughs> and they, they didn't even know what they were calculating. They were just doing check, check boxes in this form. So tractor, that was one checkbox in the red form. Uh, a baler, okay, that was a checkbox in the yellow uh, boxes. And then they would just, and then they had very clear instructions. All the greens, add them up, times it by this number, all the yellows, yada, yada. And they got a number, now that bottom number, you times it by this, and that's your price. But the girls had no clue. So when the farmer was grilling them, uh, or so I thought when the farmer would grill them, the, girl, the girls had no idea. After about a few weeks, well, after they were trained in the field, I called the meetings. Today, girls, we're going to be doing ejection handling. <clears throat> they go, what's that? So, you know, when you give them the price and the farmer wants to haggle with you, I said, John, we don't get objections. Said, Great. Okay, keep going. So, <laughs> Tutorial <I> over. <laughs> now, so I, I think some of these farmers were excited to, to just deal with them. <laughs> I was going to say, I have to ask, you, you say uh, your salespeople are all women. Uh, was that intentional on your end to hire women? It sounds like you wanted people who'd worked on a farm, but you, were you specific about their gender? No, no. So actually that, that happened by accident. So we did have guys and girls. Um, I have, ended up having to do a lot of it myself at the beginning because it was just a weird and hard job to fulfill. You know, we serviced uh, a 300 mile radius um, of farmers across the prairies. So it was a really weird job to, uh, fulfill. And what happened is one of the guys we hired, a couple of the guys we hired, they asked, well, can our girlfriends come along? And it turns out they're all from the farm. Hmm. And that we just kind of said, well, hey, I can probably fit you in here. Let me just do some basic training with you and see how it works out. And that was, a, we stumbled in it by accident. Got it. So when you say you, you had to do the job yourself, you're talking in the beginning, you did the selling yourself, you approached the farmers directly, and then you trained these, as it turned out, women to do the, uh, the selling for you. So walk me through the economics. So like you end up <clears throat> buying the metal for as little as $3 a ton, sort of in that three to five range. What are you selling it to the smelter for? Um, so yeah, I, I guess I can break that down now. Um, we were selling it between 220 to 300 a ton. Um, and of course we had costs to get it there and our, sure. our costs were not cheap. We were paying we were paying very skilled people that, you know, knew how to run this heavy equipment. They came from like Northern Ontario where there's heavy industry of logging and, you know, people that are the true MacGyvers. Like if something breaks down the middle of nowhere, they know how to fix it. So we had some incredibly talented people that were also not cheap to employ. And uh, our biggest cost was also trucking. Uh, so the fuel, we were burning at one point $22,000 of diesel a week just running our outfit. Uh, so that's, you know, and, and so we can talk a little bit about that too. That was some of the technology we implemented to help cut down those costs, which brought us to that margin. I'd love to get into that. Just to, before we leave the economics, so you would pay the farmer up front. Um, and, and just give me, I mean, like, is a farmer getting a check for like a hundred bucks, 500 bucks, 10,000 bucks, like just give me a frame of reference. Is it a few hundred dollars usually, or a few thousand? Like what would the tip Yeah, so, I mean, sure, very the dramatic. average farmer that, I mean, we, we had a great marketing plan. Like we had, we were getting 
dozens and dozens and dozens of leads a day. So we were also very good at screening and qualifying. So the average farms that we would go to uh, had at least 30 tons on it. So the average farmer was getting thousands of dollars, sometimes tens of thousands. Okay. Um, if, you know, from a traditional crushing bailing company that would go there, but also make a disaster of a mess on their farm. So yes, they got a nice check, but they had this mess that, you know, and potentially on uh, farmland that they could probably not utilize for farming either. Whereas with us, uh, we basically said enough for you to take your wife out for a dinner and a date. You know, so it was like in the hundreds generally. Okay. So, but there were still expenses along the way. How did you manage the cash? Because it sounds like a very cash intensive business because you're laying oh, out yeah. money f- to the farmer. You're laying out money for the salespeople, the truckers to get it to the smelter. <laughs> and then you're getting paid only after you kind of get it to the smelter. So Walk me through how you kind of made all the money stuff work, the cash flow in particular work. So when we negotiated with uh, the smelter, uh, you know, after that 30 day trial, when we doubled their target, which by the way, we later found out that the closest company was like 250 to 500 tons. So we mm-hmm. came in there and smashed their target at 2000. The first thing they said to me when they called me is like, who the hell are you? And where are you getting this stuff from? <laughs> And so I knew I was in a position where I could probably negotiate some cool terms. And uh, we negotiated that we can get paid the day we deliver this stuff. And so that was pretty valuable for us because earlier I mentioned that we were a scrapyard without a scrapyard. Our inventory was essentially what was on the truck. And our trucks would go straight from farm to the smelter. And so So then especially for a long time. Exactly. And so no inventory, we're very lean. And, um, you know, especially when you're starting up and scaling up, uh, sometimes I was going to that scrapyard twice a day <laughs> to make things work, like and, just to go and, collect my check. <laughs> and you guys, I mean, talking about growth, I mean, you guys grew you know, ex- exponentially. Like, just give us the, the, the metrics. So you started zero revenue. What, what, what did you get to and how quickly did you get there? Uh, so to, to give a frame of reference, like where we were operating in, in Canada, it's like a sheet of ice half the year, essentially. And where we were operating, we had to get into farmyards where ditches are the traditional deep dish ditches. So once that fills up with snow, you don't know where the farm approaches to get onto the, into the uh, field. And when you're carrying a 60 foot long trailer, because we have a special kind of trailers we can carry in Canada, uh, you can flip trucks pretty quickly. So the reason I say that is immediately our season's cut in half. We only have at best six months to operate in the year. And then number two, we're going into farm yards. This is just dirt. There's no gravel, there's no concrete, and we're bringing big, heavy trucks in. So as soon as it's raining, or you know what we would later learn to call subsoil moisture, that would also infect us. So now a 12 month year has been reduced to three months at best. Mm. So we had to really figure out, okay, how do we maximize, you know, when the sun is shining, make, make hay when the sun's shining. Yeah. That yeah. was very true for us. So revenue, um, where did you get to? Thank you. So in the, in the, our season starts, uh, started in May and by, we had a, a pretty good fall. Uh, by November, we, we hit our $5 million mark. In how many years did it take you to get to 5 million? Six months, seven months. This was in the first year you got all the way to five, 5 million from zero to 5 million. Yes. Wow. In one year. Yes. That has to be the fastest I've ever heard anybody get to $5 million in revenue. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, but it was also really stressful. So, Yeah. It, let's, well, let's talk about that because uh, like, was the, it sounds like a lot of this, at least in the early days, was really dependent on you. I mean, you're driving around to these farmers. Um, like, what did you do to, to get it to be less dependent on you personally? Or did you? Yeah, and I've, I've made some pretty big mistakes. Like, we, we had some big wins, but I don't want to shy away from the fact that I may also made some really big mistakes as well on the way. And so, 
uh, bringing in the wrong partners. Um, you know, we, we, yeah. So I'll, I'll take a step back. So I, I started this company with a partner and the, the type of business partner that I, type of entrepreneur that he is, is he's a very quick startup. Um, and he liked working the operations, being on the field, work the machines. So that allowed me to focus on the marketing, the PR, the sales. And we worked really, really well together. Uh, what comes with a, a type of entrepreneur who loves startup is that he moved on. He wanted to move on within a year or so. And so he got out. He ended up taking the import export company that I briefly touched on at the beginning. And then I took the scrap company and we, we moved on that way. Did you, so you agreed to part ways without cash exchanging hands? Like, you take this, I'll take this, and on we go. Pretty much. Yeah. You know, you I, and the they experience? were. Uh, <laughs> that's actually right when I got introduced to EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. And that was very valuable because one of the big things is that I didn't, I never really knew where to go for advice. I, I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs. And, uh, Traditionally, everyone in my family is a government worker or union worker. So, you know, what I was doing was already very different. And I didn't know where to go for advice. And so I've had, I had a few lawyers kill the deal and strain our relationship quite a bit because I just, I didn't understand that I was the one actually driving the ship and said, I let them kind of drive the ship. Um, same with a couple of accountants. And so EO really helped me hear it from a couple of other business owners going, no, you're the one in charge. You call the shots and this is how you structure the deal. And they'll advise you on, you know, the worst case scenarios, but at the end of the day, you got to call, call the shots. So that was a, that was a big one that kind of strained our relationship. But in the end, we, we, we did recover and, you know, we still catch up once in a while, which is good. Yeah, for sure. The divorce, okay. the divorce hit pretty badly after that. And, um, that's when I brought a partner in you know, we had excellent financials. We had no debt. Um, you know, basically we were getting paid instantly. So our receivables were zero. And um, that partner, I, I didn't do the proper work in creating systems of checks and balances. And, you know, even though I knew him through friends and I, I met him through uh, a church that I used to be involved with. And so I thought it was you know, a, a good deal to do and uh, showed him all my intellectual property. I basically just opened the kimono and said, come on in, let's, you know, do business. What was driving you to want a partner in the first place? So my divorce was getting pretty bad and my, I had, I was be, being torn into a different province of Canada. And especially at the time where we were, there was no direct flights. So it was a six to eight hour drive to go back home every week, deal with the divorce and, <laughs> Uh, at risk of losing custody of my son. And so I needed somebody to have boots on the ground per se, or at least that's so I thought. So I, I equipped this person to be my right hand person and I gave him absolutely everything. Um, and that was probably one of my biggest mistakes uh, because by the end of the season, of uh, that season, he thought that he was the magic of the company. There were some good systems in place in terms of the staff level, some of the managerial level, but he thought he was the magic and uh, he ended up taking half my staff, all my IP, my customer list and starting a carbon copy company right next door to us. So that was a, a fun wake up. Uh, what did you do? Yeah. I consulted a bunch of lawyers, but at, at the end of the day, I learned that uh, we have some fairly strong laws in Canada where, you know, you can non-competes don't really apply and it's only as good as the person who's willing to enforce it. So that was going to cost me a lot of money and a lot of distraction. Also, uh, we had these laws in Canada where we have a right to live or to earn a living. And that was kind of the, the biggest, um, yeah, probably the biggest weakness in the, the whole, what, what, uh, was driving me into wanting to pursue a legal action. So, what I learned from there is, you know, your intellectual property is valuable and possession is nine tenths of the law. So hmm. hang on to that stuff as much as you can, even if, you know, it's a business partner, because the legal system is not a, it's not a justice system. It's a legal system. And it's only as good as you're able to, you know, defend yourself in a court of law. I love that. I don't love the, your story and the effect that I'm sure it had on you, but I, I do love the lesson of possession being nine tenths of the law and 
and and the fact that we have a legal system, not a justice system, those are two very, very tough lessons, it sounds like, to learn. Yeah. So yeah. how did you pick up the pieces from this sort of divorce with this partner? What, what happened next? Were you able to resuscitate the business after he left? We were, actually. Um, it was interesting because there was a huge division. The people who didn't want to go believed in in the vision and in the culture of what I created. And they saw, they saw the systems, they saw what I was doing more than, um, and how would I would describe my, my ex partner? He was, he's very salesperson, very charismatic, very outgoing. And so they would call it, we don't care about the fluff. We see the, the, the we see the value here. So that, that was pretty cool because in the time of uh, polarization, our culture got really strong. And that's when, you know, I was, probably in the deepest trenches of my divorce. And it was one of those things where it's do or die. And my staff, we, you know, I doubled down with some of the technology where I was creating orientation training platforms virtually so that I could do it from a different province of the country. Uh, we would do virtual calls or, you know, just call ins on a regular cadence so that we could stay in touch. And I was able to start, I was essentially forced to create a company that can run and grow without me um, out of need. And I think where's that uh, saying, mother, the motherhood of necess- of innovation is necessity. Necess- yeah, necessity is the mother of invention, I think is, yeah. Got it. Okay, so w- w- give us a sense of, this, the, of the kinds of systems you put in place. Um, maybe, maybe give me an example of one where uh, wouldn't be necessarily typical in a lot of small businesses because a lot of small businesses listening to this business owners will say, yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard that I need standard operating procedures or SOPs, but it sounds like you went to another level. Well, like give me an example of one that, but. Yeah. So let, let me share this. Uh, you know, in my EO forum, I had a uh, forum is like our essentially a mastermind. And uh, I had a guy who was running a fairly large trucking company locally in in the province that I was stuck in. And, uh, one of the pain points in that industry for trucking is paper uh, truck drivers are notorious for not handing in their paperwork. <laughs> so like lo- dr- driver logs and stuff like that. And I started recognizing that when I'm not running a company hands on real time data is crucial, especially when these truck drivers are sitting in my biggest cost center. So my, you know, fuel and the trucks themselves. So I needed real time data. And uh, so at the time, GPS technology wasn't really strong enough because where we were didn't have strong cell phone service. We were in the middle of nowhere. So I had to, so what I did is I equipped my drivers and everyone in the company with iPhones and started to tie uh, a gamification system to this. So I was looking at creating, I created a bonus structure for every individual role and the truck drivers I, the bonus for them was you get an X amount of dollars for every ton of steel you deliver. And it was a big bonus. Sometimes it was doubling their daily pay hmm. under the following conditions. And then I started to think about what would the perfect employee be? And I, I don't know if the perfect employee exists, but I thought about, you know, piecing some, who are all my best employees I've ever had? And I started to piece together. What would that be? And so these were the conditions. So the conditions were, um, you know, you drive safely, of course, safety is number one, but what does that mean? It means that you're, you're good on the accelerator. You're not hard on the brakes. You're not hard on the equipment. So we would measure that by fuel mileage per kilometer. Um, and you would hand in your paperwork at the end of every day, which is quite difficult when your head office is 600 miles away from where these guys are driving. Uh, but because they had iPhones and they would end up in a city center where they would have Wi-Fi and stuff like that, they could scan and send it in every day. Now, and that was tied to my other people in house who were trained that if they got that data into our system so that I could read our dashboard, then they would get, they were in line for their bonuses. So, which was pretty cool because the system of bonuses was also a self-policing check and balance per se, where the girl in the office knew that if the trucker didn't send her the stuff, she wasn't going to get her bonus or the guy in the office doesn't, I had both guys and girls. Then it was, uh uh-oh, you know, I better call this trucker. And so then it was like this, the company was now the culture of like, not necessarily policing, but encouraging each other that Self, we need this. healing maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that was one example where I, I now had real time data of 
where are we at? Like, and I could start to actually project where our costs are going to be. So that was a, a big one for us. How many employees did you get to in this company? 18 was our maximum. Okay. Um, because, you know, I think with two business owners, it, it was just easier. One in front of house, one back of house to be mm-hmm. you know, roughly speaking. Um, and then by the time I sold, I was just starting to scale up again. I think I was at 13, 14. We were just rolling out our fourth crew the day that the, uh, uh, we had a, a commodity crash per se in our market. So I want to get, I want to get to that in a moment, but, uh, but you know, you've alluded to the, the lead generation system you put in place. And before this interview, I had a chance to watch the explainer video that you created, a little animated you know, two-minute video that described farm cleanup, the category. Um, and I'll put that in the show notes for people listening uh, because I think it's a, it's a tremendous example of, of, of taking ownership of this farm cleanup category and differentiating yourself from just any other scrap metal provider. What was the effect of that explainer video on your business? It was tremendous. I mean, I <clears throat> can't remember if it was a seminar. I, I attended a lot of seminars and I did a lot of training and coaching over the years uh, to, to kind of keep up with these companies. And I think it was by Joseph Campbell and he started talking about the power of stories and how, I mean, you would know this through Built to Sell you know, what it reads like a fable stories are so great for getting past the conscious and then really seeping into the subconscious. And I thought, you know, what a better way to do that if through an explainer video and, you know, scrap metal companies are generally big, tough and kind of gruff as you were explaining at the end of the call. So I, I had this cute little animated video that we created. And in the process of creating that, we, I started to outline what are all the top 10 pain points and objections that we come across. And if you watch the story, there's, you'll probably count 10 to 12 objections that I slowly un- break down uh, throughout that two minute video. We started to track our calls. And just to, to, to your point of what, the impact, the farmers that would call who watched the video versus the farmers who didn't watch the video, the ones who hadn't, it was about a 15 minute phone conversation on the initial five, point of contact. Five zero? One five. One five, 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Okay. Because it was, who are you? Are you Canadian? What do you, you know, how much are you paying? What do you mean? You don't know how much you're paying. Like it was a very like adversarial type of, you know, grilling conversation. And the ones who watched the video were five minutes in length because that's just about much time it took to take down all their information. And they were just like, and their, and their biggest question was, when can you get here? <laughs> Wow. That's the power of a video. What did the video end up costing you? Uh, well, I spent a week on the beach in Mexico, spending all the time putting this together. Um, and, I, and I used um, a freelancing platform called, it's now called Upwork. I think it cost me like a thousand dollars, but that's because I was a very do it yourself or, you know, I had coaches and I was, you know, a marketing company could have probably done it for five to 10,000, but right. But, but, but it made a huge impact on your business. Uh, and again, I love the, the, the repositioning before I let you go, let, let's just talk about the actual sale itself. Um, what triggered your desire? Uh, because you've gone through this nasty divorce, both personally, but also with a business partner. Um, that sounds, uh, difficult on every level. Was that a contributing factor to wanting to sell or was there something else? Yeah. I mean, this company was so much fun to run and uh, I truly felt it was my baby. Making that decision to let it go was very hard, but it ultimately came down to uh, the divorce was settled, but there were some pretty difficult custody challenges that I was still going through. And it was essentially a decision between, uh, losing the custody of my son or moving to a different province and running this business. So you couldn't uh, live in Saskatchewan and, and keep custody of your son. You had to move to uh, Manitoba. Yes. Seemingly at the time, the, the, just my estranged ex-wife was just, it wasn't working. And so that was the, uh, that's, that was the appearance. Was there an option to run it remotely and, and be in Winnipeg and, 
and have the business operate without you in Saskatchewan? There was, there was, um, the challenge was that, uh, I alluded to that commodity crash in uh, Canada. And so the, the, the price, commodity pricing of our steel went down. So the margins were tight for a couple of years. And in order to really maximize things, it would have required probably a lot more tightening of certain aspects, you know, including like what I would do at the end of the season, I would transport all my equipment back to my province so that we could park it where I was so I can maintain, do the maintenance on site with my staff. Those types of things were just driving so many extra costs. And it just, it was a lot of, um, unnecessary stress. So at the time it was a very hard decision, but the fact that I had uh, built the systems and that I had staff that were running most of the operations and I kind of had like a, a blueprint printing cash gave me that option to be able to uh, approach my employees with, obviously they had a lot of enthusiastic interest in buying it. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So did you think about selling it externally or what made you decide to sell to your employees? I think speed was the, the big factor because they saw everything. They didn't have to run a lot of due diligence. They understood it. Um, and uh, because our industry was quite depressed at the time. So to you know, quickly explain that the person I was selling my scrap metal to, they were melting it down and making oil and gas equipment and, and supply. And because that market was affected as well in 2015, 16, you know, everyone kind of got the trickle down effect of that uh, de mini depression per se. So um, that was, uh, that, that was the, uh, um, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, no, but the, I was wondering about why you decided, did you think about marketing the business externally, like oh, hiring yes, a, an you. advisor or whatever, but it sounds Sorry like you that. went pretty quickly. No, that's okay. You went pretty quickly to uh, sell to my employees. And uh, I just be the curious reason being what, for that. Yeah. 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 Sorry. And so the reason for that is because the business wasn't operating like it had been in the past. <laughs> so a few of the people that, you know, were interested in it, they were more panicking about, well, why did the margins go down? And, and it's, the explanation of, well, it's because the market went down, just wait another year or two, it will go back up to an outsider. They just couldn't understand that. They, they saw a shrinking business that was nose diving, whereas the employees, they had been around and they understood that. So that was kind of the advantage. There's the company at the time. And uh, I took a year off. We waited because the market got so bad. So we just waited. It was producing no revenue, but yeah. To sell it to those employees, they paid more than definitely just the asset value because they saw that there was a, a blueprint here once the market came back. Which how did you how did you value the company? Uh, that was just a negotiation between us and them. Uh, it basically, came down to me helping them. I built them a, a business plan and approached financing with them to help them figure out what they can get financing for. And uh, I wasn't interested in an earnout or a long term, so we maximize what we could and i got paid out for it how did you get them financing like who who was willing to finance that good question uh we approached um i guess what would they call be called um like b lenders so they were very they were very asset based and they were willing to give the assets a very high value to make up for the goodwill portion that my employees it were paying Okay. And the assets in this case are what, 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 what are the assets that you have? So we, we would uh, buy these uh, excavators um, and outfit them with custom grapples, magnets, uh, trailers. We would make custom bins that would go on the trailers, lots of uh, service vehicles. Um, and then th those are like the, the hard assets per se. And then everything else was just like, the contracts and how we would market and how we would reach the farmers. That was the soft assets per se. And how did you come up with a number in your mind? I know you say it was a negotiation, but did you have sort of a magic number? You thought, you know, like if I can get this, I'm good. Or like, how, how did you figure that out? Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to put myself back into that situation. I think I was mostly just trying to simplify to get, like I mentioned, we weren't operating for that one year. So I had a, I, st I still had a whole bunch of costs. I was, we were still maintaining, repairing. So costs and no rent and uh, no revenue. Uh, so that was a pain point for me. 
And I, I had no, we knew what we had made for profits over the years. So it was just a, a bit of a, a negotiation between here's what we've made, here was our averages, here's what's costing me, I'm willing to let it go today for this much. And, uh, yeah. and did you have a multiple in mind? Like, was it a multiple of your assets or a multiple of profits in the good years? Like, how did you figure that out? Good question. I didn't. Um, it was essentially just, you know, here's what we made for profits. Um, considering the company wasn't running, it was over one and it was under two. So it was like somewhere in that range. Um, yeah. Got it. That's helpful for sure. And then with regards to getting financing, so are you saying that you had all this equipment, the Italian magnet, I had this visualized <laughs> the, like huge magnet you bring down out of some truck, all these assets, um, the, were, are you saying that the, the B lender was willing to finance them at a, at a rate higher than their market value in an auction site, for example, like you, if, Definitely higher than an auction site. Um, I mean, they, they saw value in the assets that we, that we placed on them as a whole. Mm -hmm. And we just said, look, everything as a whole, here it is, is the package. And they came out with their own valuations and it worked. So we were, we, they were happy and I was happy. So I, I had no earn out. Yeah. Okay. And so the B lenders recourse, if, if the employees as a collective were to have reneged on that interest payment to the B lender, the B lender would have gotten those assets. They weren't, were, were, the, were your employees personally guaranteeing the loan? Were they on the hook personally? That's a good question. I, um, I didn't see the final paperwork. Um, the, uh, the lender wouldn't let me see it at the, in the end. Hmm. Um, they said Privacy Act, who knows, maybe, who knows? But I, I, I think what happened, at least for some of it, I think it was the lender bought the assets and leased to owned it. I think that's what happened on a couple of them. Mm. But from what I understand, uh, the market came back and my employees paid it out very quickly, like way earlier. I think they even paid a little bit of an early payout penalty because they made the money and some. So I'm not sure exactly how it all turned out. I should ask them next time I see them. Yeah. How did you handle it? And again, if, if I'm asking you questions, you can't answer. Don't want to answer. Just tell me to go to hell. But with your former wife, presumably she had some claim over the value of this business. How did you guys deal with that? Did she have a say on, in and how much you could sell it for, or who you could sell it to, or did she have any sort of claim over this? Uh, it was definitely a contentious part of uh, the divorce because the company was doing very well. Um, turns out I started this company uh, six months after I, you know, we called it quits and I moved out and, you know, mm. stuff like that. Um, so then that was part of the divorce issue is then they were trying to argue that, well, we weren't quite over yet. And, um, I mean, you hear about this stuff and unfortunately I had to live through this stuff. So, uh, turns out her companies did very well as well. So, you know, in the end we was just like, okay, you keep yours and you keep, I keep mine and let's just leave each other Got alone. Got it. Right. Because in a divorce, you, you know, the, the value created while you're a couple is what is sort of in question, as I understand it. Exactly. Got it. Fascinating. Did you buy yourself any sort of trophy or, or uh, reward for uh, when you sold? Was there any, any sort of memento that you bought to kind of commemorate the experience? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I mean, one of the things I did is I, I, I bought a fourplex in, uh, in Winnipeg and, uh, I mean, it's not very, uh, <laughs> it's not a memento per se, but it is the antithesis of what I've built as a company with print metals because, uh, and I went ahead and way over renovated one of the units that I, I, I now live in because it now significant, uh, signifies stability <laughs> and security. So, you know, no matter what my business is doing, I pay no rent. I live for free and, uh, yeah, and I'm hey, still listen, in it today. The, it's, you know, they say that's the one benefit of, of real estate. Like it's never going to zero. It may not go up as much as a stock or a bond <laughs> or whatever, but it's never going to zero. So that's true. It's, uh, 
Uh, it's fascinating. Well, listen, it's, um, it's amazing to hear this story. I know people are going to want to reach out. What's, uh, what are you up to now and where can people find you if they want to uh, Rich, are you in Winnipeg or? Yeah, so I'm based in Winnipeg. Um, I, I do have my son back now and uh, that's exciting. Right. So I decided to um, stop buying companies for a little while, you know, buying, fixing, selling, all that stuff um, and make, uh, helping other companies do that as my primary. I did that as my secondary for the last 10 years and now I do that as my primary. Um, I do have a website, it's called growthstrategy.ca and uh, yeah, they can reach out and speak to me through there. And we'll put that in the show notes, built to sell.com as well as uh, the link to the explainer video uh, and, and, and uh, your website and so forth, because uh, I'd love for people to check out the explainer video. It, it, it is such an amazing story of, of remaking and repositioning uh, a business and, and taking an ownership in a certain a new category where you're the leader of one. So I appreciate you sharing this story and um, uh, let's stay in touch. Thanks for joining Eric. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you, and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at facebook.com slash built to sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.